we are getting closer to a SpaceX launch of a Falcon 9 rocket from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. On that rocket, TEMPO, which stands for the Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring of Pollution. I'm NASA's Angelique Herring, and NASA partnered with the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian for the TEMPO mission. The TEMPO instrument will improve life on Earth by revolutionizing the way that scientists observe air quality. When the air around us gets full of harmful chemicals, it can make breathing and living a lot harder to do. One of the ways that we can keep our air clean is by keeping an eye on what's in it. TEMPO, or the Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring of Pollution, is a NASA satellite instrument that's going to help us do just that. From the top of the Intel Sat-40E satellite, the TEMPO instrument will be taking hourly data during all daylight hours from the fixed orbit that will allow us to see North America all the time. That's really important because this will be the first satellite instrument to be taking these kinds of measurements. And all of that rich new data is going to help us to understand how different chemicals like waste from landfills or from car emissions or even the burning of coal affect the air quality that we breathe here in North America. And Tempo won't be working alone. Tempo will actually be working alongside Europe's Sentinel-4 satellite instrument as well as South Korea's GEMS satellite instrument. In addition to a number of airborne science missions and ground monitors all coming together to give scientists a more complete picture of the impacts and sources of atmospheric pollution here on Earth. I'm joined now by Division Director of the Earth Science Division for NASA, Karen St. Germain. Karen, it's so great to have you here, and I know that you and your team must be so excited for launch. Well, thanks, Angelique. You know, we've been working on Tempo for years now, and it is an absolute thrill to be here for the launch. It's great to have you here. And could you tell me a little bit about what kind of information we're actually hoping to learn from this wide-scale look at air quality that Tempo will be giving us? Sure. Well, air pollution comes from many sources, from automobiles and, and trucks and cargo ships to power plants and factories to natural events like wildfires and volcanoes. And when those pollutants, chemicals and, and particles, get into the air, they, they change over time. They move and their composition changes. So with the ability to see these, uh, the atmospheric composition every hour, we can understand how those changes happen over time, and that's just going to give us a much better understanding of the life cycle of these pollutants. That's so exciting that we'll be able to understand a little bit better. How can that understanding and, and all of this new data help us to make better predictions about future air quality? Well, it'll help in two ways. First, it will give us much better situational awareness when an event is happening. But also, that understanding that we get from those repeated looks, we'll be able to capture that understanding in models that allow us to predict future conditions. And that's really where we bring the power of NASA missions to bear on our operational agencies like EPA and NOAA and FEMA. We can feed them that understanding, those models, and they then can turn that into more effective operations. How exciting. Now, speaking of different satellites, I know at the tail end of last year, NASA actually launched a satellite that is able to measure all of Earth's water. Now that we will soon be able to measure air quality all over North America, do you think that there will be opportunities to use those data sources together? Absolutely. You know, Angelique, the, the Earth works as a system. What happens in the water is connected to what happens in the atmosphere and on land. So all of these missions working together, observing different parts of the system, give us that understanding about how the whole system is evolving over time. And so, yeah, we really look forward to bringing together the data from these multiple systems. How exciting. Thank you so much, Karen, for taking some time to talk with us. It's great to be here. Thank you. Now, Tempo will let scientists see emissions as they occur throughout the day, hour by hour, instead of a single sampling. Researchers say that this is a major step forward in monitoring air quality. Uh, when we talk about air quality, we're really talking about the health of the population as it has to breathe the, the air that, 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 that we need to live. One of the real difficulties in, in helping people understand that, that air quality is a problem is that uh, on a beautiful day, you may not see evidence of poor air quality, but it's there. Uh, you might be surprised to hear that the number of deaths in the United States per year attributed to air quality is estimated to be about 60,000. I'm Jim Crawford. I'm the senior scientist here at NASA Langley Research Center for Atmospheric Chemistry. And my job as an atmospheric chemist, I work with a team of scientists trying to study air quality in the atmosphere. We do that with research aircraft. For a couple of decades now, we've really benefited from space 
in terms of satellite observations very far. But those observations have been from the low Earth orbit where we get one look per day. And you can imagine that in terms of understanding a day in the life of a city, in terms of the early emissions in the morning from rush hour and all the chemistry that takes place uh, throughout the day, a lot can happen that we need to understand. What we're getting from Tempo is both that continuity and the high resolution. It's important to recognize that Tempo doesn't work alone. It has to be integrated into what we call the observing system. You have ground monitors, which are measuring at the highest precision what air quality conditions are. You have airborne measurements, which can't be done continuously, but can bring into the picture great information about uh, the complexity of the air quality conditions and what's happening above our head, which plays a role in what we breathe down here. When we talk about air quality, uh, it's not a problem that you simply solve at one moment in time. Human activity changes over time. Populations shift. Industries rise and fall. We really need to be able to monitor how those things are changing because the air quality outcomes change in concert with the changes in what we put into the atmosphere. And so we don't need one look, we need continuous looks to be able to see and respond to uh, what's happening in terms of atmosphere and its response to human emissions. This launch is happening during a busy week for NASA. On Monday, NASA revealed the moon crew. Four astronauts were chosen to crew Artemis II next year. Your mission specialist, Christina Hammett Koch. Your mission specialist, Jeremy Hansen. Your Artemis II pilot, Victor Glover. Your Artemis II commander, Reed Wiseman. We're going to hear the words, go for launch. On top of the most powerful rocket NASA's ever made, the Space Launch System. These four astronauts will travel 600,000 miles around the moon and back in the Orion capsule. And we are going to the moon together. Let's go. The Artemis II mission will mark the first time humans are that close to the moon in more than 50 years. This is a global effort, Artemis II, and it's only going to get larger with Artemis III and beyond. So to the NASA workforce, we say a huge thank you. It is the next step on the journey that gets humanity to Mars. The Artemis II crew represents thousands of people working tirelessly to bring us to the stars. This is their crew. This is our crew. This is humanity's crew. The first crewed Artemis mission is set for 2024. Congratulations to our moon crew. We can't wait to see you fly. NASA scientists have been collecting air pollution measurements for more than two decades from low Earth orbit. Tempo will take a look at three main pollutants, nitrogen dioxide, formaldehyde, and ozone. Well, we've been doing satellites with colleagues for number of years, but this is the first one that has these special qualities. No other Earth observing satellite has ever been designed to specifically measure ozone in the lowest atmosphere. TIMBO is something we've been working on for a number of years, so we're very, very excited and we can't hardly wait until we get up and, and, and see what we can learn. My name is Kelly Chance. I'm the principal investigator for TEMPO, which is a NASA and Smithsonian space instrument. It's going to launch this April, and we will be measuring atmospheric pollution for greater North America every hour. My first job as principal investigator is to make the instrument work so the data are available for everyone. But then my research group and I will be doing all kinds of scientific experiments, learning in detail about where the pollution is and how it affects us and how hopefully we can predict it better and make it better. The Tempo instrument is a grading UV visible spectrometer. It sits on a commercial communication satellite called Intelsat 40E that weighs 13,600 pounds. That's the same as about 10 elephants. The satellite has two deployable solar arrays, which combine measure 81 feet, and that's almost the length of a basketball court. Tempo is designed to monitor the same place all the time, which is why it'll be in geostationary orbit about 22,000 miles above Earth's equator, traveling 7,000 miles per hour. Now, geostationary re refers to where and how the satellite will orbit the Earth. It will be placed above Earth's equator with an orbital time matching Earth's rotation. This way, Tempo will be able to sweep the entire continent once every hour, 
delivering near real-time data. As we near launch, let's learn more about how Tempo data will be used with Erica Wright, our education specialist at Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Hi, Erica. Hi, Angelique. It's so exciting to be here with you today for launch. It's so exciting to have you here. Erica, could you, can you tell us a little bit more about the different sources of pollution that Tempo will be measuring? Absolutely. So Tempo is going to measure a number of key air quality constituents that tell us um, things about impacts on human health, agriculture, and in our environment. It's going to be things like nitrogen dioxide, things that our cars and other combustion engines put out, uh, formaldehyde, uh, and these are categories of pollutants called uh, volatile organic compounds, things that you might smell, markers and paints and things like that, uh, as well as ozone, which might be one that you know our listeners are thinking about um, the ozone hole, right? A lot of people think about the ozone hole, and that's a good thing. You want to close that in, and we want more ozone. But down here on Earth, it's actually um, a pollutant that when humans breathe it in, it can cause injury and damage to both us and our environment. So those are some of the things, just some of the numbers of many pollutants that Tempo will be measuring. There are definitely a lot of pollutants and definitely a lot of information we're going to be getting. Absolutely. Can you tell me how the public will be able to access and learn from that information? Absolutely. Uh, so Tempo data is going to be publicly available online for the via various uh, NASA interfaces as well as Smithsonian interfaces, so anybody can access it themselves, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, that data is going to tell them things about their local backyard, so they can look up what's happening outside today and maybe even make decisions, do I want to go for a run today, right? Is their quality a little bad today? Maybe I'll stay inside or work out inside. Uh, so there's a lot of great local information that you can get from the Tempo data. And Erica, who are some of the early adopters of Tempo, and how can they use this day-to-day -day information to actually de decrease pollution in the future? Yeah, so there's actually a whole community of Tempo early adopters. Over 300 individuals and organizations have signed on to be part of uh, the Tempo Ado early adopters program and learn about how to use that data right away. And so those are state and local air quality uh, regulators, those are health uh, researchers, there are uh, community organizations um, and nonprofits that want to use the data uh, to improve their local air quality and study impacts on our human health and the environment. That's so incredibly exciting. Can't wait to see what's happening with all of that data. Thank you so much, Erica, for taking some time to talk with us about Thanks it. Thanks so much for having me. In just a few moments, launch coverage will continue with our friends at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California, as they walk us through Terminal Count Live. We'll see you after launch. Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, Florida. Welcome to our live launch coverage of the IS-40E and Tempo mission for our customer, Intelsat. Today's launch marks our 222nd overall SpaceX mission to date and our 23rd launch this year. My name is Kate Tice, Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX, and I'm joining you today from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. We have a pretty unique payload on board the second stage tonight, IS-40E, is a geosynchronous communication satellite that will provide coverage over North America for Intelsat's commercial aviation, mobility, and network service customers. Attached to IS-40E is NASA's Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring Pollution, or TEMPO, instrument. Operated by Intelsat, TEMPO is a partnership between NASA and the Smithsonian Institution's Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and will improve life on Earth by revolutionizing the way scientists observe air quality. It will also be the first space-based instrument to monitor and track air pollution across North America on an hourly basis and report observations during the day. The satellite is scheduled to enter into service next month and TEMPO will start operations this summer. Here's a little more on Intelsat and today's payload.
Intelsat is bridging the digital divide by operating one of the world's largest satellite fleet and connectivity infrastructures, enabling people and their tools to speak over oceans, see across continents, and listen through the skies to communicate, cooperate, and coexist. With a history of firsts in telecommunications, Intelsat team members are addressing a new generation of challenges. is is the latest addition to our fleet of 56 geostationary satellites. They will be operated at 91 West, so over North America. Its primary mission is manage mobility services over North America. Intelsat IS-40E satellite will provide focused coverage for many of Intelsat's business units. The E stands for EPIC, a high-throughput satellite connecting customers in the air, on the ground, and at sea. It means in-flight connectivity for commercial airline passengers, connectivity for people on business jets, connectivity for maritime users like people on cruise ships, as well as mobility for disaster recovery. In addition to serving Intelsat customers, IS-40E will host a NASA and Smithsonian payload called Tempo. Intelsat will operate the instrument while it monitors and tracks air pollution across North America on an hourly basis with the ability to stay over a region of interest during a natural disaster, like a major fire or volcanic eruption. This is going to be the first time that we have an instrument providing air quality measurement from the geostationary orbit. It will allow to better understand the dynamics of air quality over the large cities. Intelsat's role is basically to provide um, the ground systems which enables the Smithsonian to send commands to the satellite and obtain measured data. This measured data then is stored in our Riverside systems that will be accessed by the Smithsonian for analysis and uh, provide to NASA. Hi everyone, I'm Ronnie Foreman and I'm a commercial sales manager here at SpaceX. I'm excited to join you and Kate to cover the IS-40E mission tonight. With liftoff just about seven minutes from now, I want to talk to you first a little bit more about the rocket supporting tonight's launch. Our Falcon 9 vehicle that you see on the pad is a two-stage rocket designed and manufactured by SpaceX. Standing 229 feet tall, the Falcon 9 is about 40 feet taller than the Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy. And for all you Star Wars fans out there, Falcon 9 was named after the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. The number 9 indicates the number of Merlin 1D engines on the first stage, which make up the bottom two-thirds of the vehicle. Speaking of the first stage, its objective is to accelerate the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere to space and then separate from the rest of the rocket. This first stage, also referred to as the booster, is flying for the stage fourth four, time. RP1 load complete. There you hear the call out that we've completed RP-1 loading into the booster, which again is for flying for the fourth time today. It previously supported CRS-26, OneWeb Launch 16, and a past Starlink mission. We will attempt to recover this booster again on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, which is currently positioned in the Atlantic Ocean, and you can see it on your screen now. If successful, that will mark our 184th landing of an orbital class rocket, including both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy side boosters. Moving on up, Above the first stage is the second stage, which has a single Merlin vacuum or MVAC engine that ignites after stage separation. The second stage is what will carry the Intelsat 40E and NASA Smithsonian Tempo payload to orbit. Speaking of the payload, it's currently safely tucked inside the 17-foot diameter payload fairing that you see on your screen now. It's a large barrel structure with a pointed nose at the very top of the rocket. Made of carbon composite material, the fairing protects the payload from aerothermal heating and contamination on its trip to space, before being jettisoned approximately three minutes into flight. Much like the first stage, the fairing halves on today's flight are flight proven. One half is flying for the second time and the other for its eighth. You there you hear the call out that we're getting ready for strong back retract. After separation, those fairing halves will return to Earth to be recovered by our recovery vessel, Doug. And the large trust structure that you see next to Falcon 9 is what we were just talking about on the nets. That's the transporter erector, or TE for short. 
We use it to roll the rocket out to the pad and raise it to its vertical launch position ahead of takeoff. Strong back lower started. The call out there says that we're beginning to pull the TE away from the vehicle. The TE also routes the vehicle's fluids, power, and telemetry umbilicals from the ground systems to the rocket and satellites until Falcon 9 transfers to internal power and clears the pad. There you can see the clamp arms are opening up beneath the fairing in preparation for full TE retraction. And as Ronnie mentioned, those clamp arms are now open and we should hear the call out momentarily that the strong back is reclining. Actually, I think we can see it there on screen now. At T0, the ground hydraulic systems will pull the TE even further away from the Falcon 9 as it lifts off. At this point in the countdown, both the first and second stages are nearly fully loaded with 1 million pounds of liquid oxygen and kerosene fuel. We use two propellants, a refined form of kerosene. Stage one, lock flow complete. There we heard that call out. Stage one is now fully loaded with all of its liquid oxygen and fuel. Stage two is undergoing its lock load. Uh, uh, full fuel load is complete on stage two. We expect locks loading to wrap up at T minus two minutes. The liquid oxygen is chilled well below its boiling point so that it has a much greater amount of mass per volume, allowing us to load more of it into the rocket. In addition to these two propellants, we also use a chemical TTEB or triethyl aluminum and triethyl borane, and we use that as our ignition source. The combustion of RP1 and LOX is what makes the rocket go, and it's the TTEB that sets the match to that propellant mix. So once again, the first stage has all of its propellants on board, fully loaded with all of its liquid oxygen and RP1. That RP1 load is complete on the second stage, and we're expecting the LOX load to wrap up here any second now on the second stage. At T minus 60 seconds, we'll hear the call out. Falcon 9 is in startup. It's an indication that the onboard uh, internal flight computers have taken over the launch countdown. And just inside T minus two seconds, we light the Merlin 1D engines for liftoff. Stage two, lock flow complete. And there's that call out. So as of now, Falcon 9 is fully loaded with all of its propellants. The IS-40E and Tempo payload continues to be healthy and the Falcon 9 team is tracking no major issues on the rocket. Currently, weather is green. Gotta close out. Weather is green and the range is ready to support a T0 of 1230 a.m. Eastern time, just one minute and 20 seconds from now. We heard that call a little bit ago for the uh, ground closeouts. We'll now see some more of that liquid oxygen venting from the TE as those lines are now closed out to the vehicle. Falcon 9 is in startup. All right, there's that call out letting us know that the onboard flight computers have taken control of the launch countdown. LD, go for launch. And there's our final go for launch tonight coming from our launch director. We're now at T minus 35 seconds. All systems are go for launch of Falcon 9 with the Intel Sat 40E and NASA. 30 seconds and the NASA Smithsonian Tempo payload. Let's listen in to the terminal count. Fifteen seconds. Two minutes, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition, engine full power, and lift off. This is that 40 e Go, this is Go, Falcon. The vehicle is pitching down range. M1D chamber pressure problem.
If you're just joining us, those gorgeous views on your screen mean that Falcon 9 has successfully lifted off from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. During nominal a power and telemetry. They call out there that nominal power and telemetry for the vehicle. During this phase, which is called ascent, we tilt the engines. The technical term for this is called gimbling. And that turns the rocket horizontally in what we call a gravity turn. We're Falcon 9 is supersonic. There's a call out that Falcon 9 is now traveling faster than the speed of sound. During this period, we're still going up, but we're also heading horizontally away from the launch Max pad. Q. Just moments ago, we throttled down in preparation for max Q, which is the period of maximum aerodynamic pressure that the vehicle will see on ascent. So that's what's happening right now. The rocket typically needs to go about 17,500 miles per hour horizontally in order to avoid being pulled back to Earth and reach orbit. Now we're going to have three events coming up in quick Come succession, back, cool. starting with main engine cutoff, stage separation, and second engine start one. Main engine cutoff, or MECO, is the point during the flight where we shut down the nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage. Shortly after that, stages one and two will separate from each other so that the second stage isn't carrying unnecessary mass to orbit. And of course, the first stage booster begins its trip back to Earth. The last call out you heard was about the MVAC engine. That's what we're gonna start up during SES-1 or second engine start one. That's the period during the flight where we'll ignite the Merlin vacuum engine on board the second stage for the first time. So we'll see all three of those happen back to back just about 10 seconds from now. Go. State separation confirmed. And back ignition. So there you heard and definitely saw those great views on your screen. Three events happening back to back. Main engine cutoff, stage separation, and SES-1. Coming up next will be fairing separation in just a couple of seconds. During this portion of the flight, we'll jettison both fairing halves and then attempt to retrieve them again today. Both vehicles are following nominal trajectories. Fairing separation confirmed. There we've got confirmation of fairing separation, which means both fairing halves are on their way back to Earth to be recovered by our recovery vessel, Doug. Coming up next, there are two burns for our first stage as we prepare for landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. We're now T plus three minutes and 54 seconds into today's mission. And we're currently, as you there see there on your screen, we're in the first of two planned MVAC burns that will occur prior to satellite deployment. At T plus six minutes and 31 seconds or around there, you should see on your screen the first stage's entry burn. For that entry burn, we relight three M1D engines, which are the uh, those nine engines at the base or the bottom of the first stage. Uh, we will relight first the center engine or called E9. And then shortly thereafter, we will also relight two radial engines, engines one and five. And all three of those together will help slow the vehicle down as it passes back into the Earth's atmosphere. We perform that re-entry burn in order to slow, uh, excuse me, to slow down uh, the booster, which helps to reduce those re-entry forces that it sees, and in turn, that helps us recover and reuse our first stages. Both vehicles continue to follow nominal trajectories. Although we can't see the first stage right now, you can follow along with the telemetry there in the bottom left-hand corner for stage one, and then that stage two telemetry there in the right-hand uh, bottom corner of your screen. We can see that the first stage is now beginning its descent uh, back to Earth, so it, is, it has already passed through its apogee, making its way uh, back down. This time we are targeting a 
landing on our drone ship, which is parked a couple hundred miles off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, during that entry burn, it, Falcon 9 is decelerating, is decelerating by firing its Merlin engines, but it's still moving very rapidly. This causes the vehicle to fly through Merlin's exhaust gases, also known as the rocket's plume, and by doing so, we get a deposit of soot on the, uh, on the vehicle surface. That soot then uh, basically comes from the carbon-based fuel that Falcon 9 uses. We're expecting that entry burn to begin in about 20 seconds. Everything continues to look good there. For that second stage, we can see that MVAC engine, uh, which is the singular Merlin engine designed for use in the vacuum of space, uh, attached there to our second stage. Stage, stage one, entry burn, startup. Stage one, FTS is saved. All right, so there on that left-hand side of your screen, those stage one views are back. We can see that entry burn has begun, and it's also illuminating the grid fins, which help to steer the booster for re-entry and also to make a precise landing. Stage one, entry burn shut down. All right, we can see that entry burn has concluded. Both vehicles continue to follow nominal trajectories. As a reminder, the first stage that we saw there on the left-hand side of your screen, um, that performed the entry burn for the fourth time. It previously supported CRS-26, OneWeb Launch 16, and a Starlink mission. Falcon 9 is the world's first orbital class reusable rocket, and this is important because reusability allows SpaceX to refly the most expensive parts of the rocket, which in turn drives down the cost of space access. Terminal guidance. The next major milestone we have coming up is SECO, or Second Engine Cutoff 1, which is coming up in about 20 seconds. That will be followed very quickly. Stage one, transonic. And that call out tells us that the first stage is traveling near the speed of sound. That first stage will uh, begin its landing burn just after we have the second engine cut off. And back shut down. All right, there's that call out telling us that we had successful shutdown or cutoff of that. Stage one landing burn. You can see landing burn has begun there on that screen. Stage two FTS is saved. You can see those grid fins working hard to steer it back to the drone ship for its landing. Nominal orbit insertion. Great call out there indicating we've Stage got. Stage one landing leg deploy. Stage one landing confirmed. There you can see on your screen an amazing view as always. Uh, that landing marks SpaceX's 184th recovery of an orbital class rocket, including first stage landings for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Uh, the mission isn't over just yet. We did hear the call out telling us that the second stage achieved good orbit, so it is now embarking on its first coast phase. After this coast phase, we will light that MVAC engine for a second time, and that will happen around the T plus 26 minute mark. So hang tight, we'll see you back here in about 15 minutes.
position of signal of the ball. Welcome back to the SpaceX webcast. Tonight's Falcon 9 mission is carrying the Intelsat 40E and NASA Smithsonian Tempo payload for our customer Intelsat. We've had a nominal mission so far. Falcon 9 launched on time at 12.30 a.m. Eastern from Space Launch Complex 40 and then successfully landed on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas. While the second stage completed its first burn, taking our payload into its initial parking orbit. We're just about five seconds away from a second ignition of the Merlin vacuum engine, which will carry the second stage and today's payload into the orbit needed to deploy the satellite. Back ignition. There's the confirmation we've got for SES-2, second engine start two. This burn of the MVAC engine is planned to last just about a minute. Right now you can see the MVAC skirt glowing orange as it burns, excuse me, as the engine burns. While the MVAC and Merlin engines on board the first stage are quite similar, the MVAC is unique in that it's been optimized to perform in the vacuum of space, which gives it its, gives it its name, Merlin Vacuum. Just about 10 seconds to go on this burn before we, hear, before we expect to hear the call out for SECO2. MVAC shutdown. There's the confirmation of MVAC shutdown. Nominal orbit insertion. That call out confirms that we're in the correct orbit. So right now the payload is still attached to Falcon 9's second stage with deployment scheduled in just about four minutes. While we wait, sit back and enjoy the views.
know how to be shot. If you're just joining us, welcome to the webcast for the IS-40E and Tempo mission. We've had a nominal mission so far with an on-time liftoff at 12.30 a.m. Eastern Time, followed by successful ascent, stage separation, and two second stage engine burns. We're now coming up on the final mission milestone of the day, and that's payload deployment, of course. And that payload, payload, as you see there on your screen, will be deploying from our second stage. As a reminder, our customer for today's mission is Intelsat, and their IS-40E payload is a geosynchronous communication satellite that also features a NASA payload, TEMPO, or Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring Pollution. The payload will be operated by Intelsat, but TEMPO is a partnership between NASA and the Smithsonian Institution's Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Payload separation confirmed. A beautiful view there, as you can see, and as we heard called out, successful confirmation of the Intelsat 40E and NASA Smithsonian Tempo payload. All of us here at SpaceX want to give a big thank you to our Spaces customer, Intelsat, for entrusting us primary with today's mission. We also want to give a shout out to the range and Federal Aviation Administration for supporting today's launch. Tonight's flight concludes SpaceX's 222nd overall mission to date and our 23rd launch of 2023. Thanks to all our viewers for tuning in. Hope you enjoy the rest of your morning and we'll see you again soon. That's going to wrap up NASA and SpaceX coverage of the launch of Intel Sat 40E and Tempo. You can find more information about this mission and other NASA launches by going to nasa.gov. For NASA Communications, I'm Angelique Herring. Have a good night.